Hi there, welcome to my quick tour and review of the St Pancras Renaissance Hotel in Central London, United Kingdom. Like most people, I will stay here simply to use the adjacent St Pancras International Rail Station the following day. Okay, I'm also a sucker for a nice five-star hotel, especially one that's contained in such historic Victorian architecture. Before we look at the hotel today, a bit of history. The hotel was originally built in 1873 as the Midland Grand Hotel and it was designed by the architect Sir George Gilbert Scott in the Victorian Gothic style. The Midland Grand Hotel was a luxurious destination for travellers arriving in London by train and it quickly became one of the city's most iconic buildings. However, by the early 20th century, the Midland Grand Hotel had fallen out of favour with travellers and it was eventually closed in 1935. The building then used as offices for London, Midland and Scottish Railway and it suffered from neglect and decay over the years. In 1985, the building was purchased by the London and Continental Railways with the intention of turning it into a luxury hotel. The restoration and renovation of the building took many years and cost over £200 million sterling. Finally, in 2011, the St Pancras Renaissance Hotel opened to the public. Sadly, in 1996, the Midland Hotel was the scene of an appalling atrocity because it was where the world's most annoying girl group, the Spice Girls, filmed their video for their debut single, Wannabe. Thankfully, in 2023, 27 years on, there is no indication in the present hotel of that appalling episode. As I mentioned in the video intro, this hotel was completely refurbished in the year 2011 at a cost of £200 million sterling. And when you enter the lobby, particularly at night of the present day hotel, you'll see where much of that money was spent. The ambience you feel is of original Victorian brickwork mixed with 21st century styling and technology. I imagine that you, like me, are intending to stay here because you're going to be using the International Rail Station in the morning. So let's take a look around St Pancras International before we go up to the hotel room. This is the station main entrance opposite the London Underground Station. However, you don't need to worry about this because if you're staying in the hotel, there's a direct link between the hotel and the station. If you've not been to St Pancras International Station in London before, you might be in for a pleasant surprise. The station was extensively refurbished between the years 2001 and 2007 at a cost of over £800 million sterling. The Victorian brickwork was all retained and cleaned up, as was the station's wrought iron work, but the station was completely reglazed. But more or less everything else is 21st century rebuild. Today the station is both a national and an international rail hub, but also a retail and restaurant space in its own right. Even if you're not going to use the hotel's restaurants, which I actually recommend you do, and we'll look at that in a minute, there are a number of dining options available to you on the station concourse. If you're using the Eurostar in the morning, then the Eurostar departures terminal is just five minutes walk from the hotel. Okay, quick plug here. If you're interested in using the Eurostar and you haven't before from this station, check out my video on using the Eurostar to start off my journey to the city of Berlin. Link in the top right hand corner. Located in the south upper level of the station is the famous Meeting Place sculpture. Commissioned in the year 2011 by London and Continental Railways, constructed of brass, it stands nine metres high and cost a reported one million pounds sterling. As we pass by the statue, we're now going to exit the station through the south archway and head back to the hotel, which is literally three minutes walk away, just to the right of the arch. We're now back at the hotel main entrance, looking into the lobby that was so desecrated by the Spice Girls in 1996, and the check-in desks are on the right, and looking directly to the front is the lobby bar. Fun fact, this used to be a taxi rank in the 1930s. While I pan the camera over some impressive architecture, here's some data on the hotel. The hotel is run by the Marriott Group. It is five stars, it has 244 bedrooms, two restaurants, two bars and a health and leisure centre. The starting price for a room in this hotel is between £350 and £400 sterling a night. I booked my room through Booking.com which I found to be cheaper than the hotel's own website. 
However, when I came to check in, I did find the check in was quite slow. There was only one agent on duty at the desk and she was stuck dealing with two customers whose credit card had stopped working. So not really her fault. Actually, the slow check in is my only real criticism of this hotel. What I did like a check in is they give you a map of the hotel and I really wish more hotels did this. Because this is a historic building, the layout of the hotel is not straightforward and the map was a big help. However, don't worry, finding your room is not like an episode of The Crystal Maze. Quite straightforward. In fact, I'll show you the route through the Victorian historic corridors to the lift lobby now. Only if you're on the ground floor will your room be of Victorian vintage, because most rooms in the hotel are situated in a modern structure that was built from scratch when the hotel was refurbished, and therefore are of a modern standard. The lifts in this hotel I found to be really quick and efficient and quite spacious with your luggage. Also, a nice point, they open up as you approach. There's no need to press the button. From the Victorian architecture that you find on the ground floor, once the lift doors open, and we're staying on the seventh floor here, you'll find yourself very firmly back in the 21st century. The corridors in this hotel are wide and are very brightly lit which is unusual for five-star hotels in London for some reason. The decor is immaculate and the furnishings classic. As mentioned, just for one night, we're going to be staying in a standard double room, room 724, and access to the room is via a modern Riffid card reader. So let's take a look around a standard room in this hotel. My first impression is that the standard room is not huge. Okay, it's not tidy, but it's certainly not huge. And in all honesty though, it's about average for a central London four or five star hotel. As you enter, the storage is on the left and the bathroom entrance is on the right. As we pan around the room, you'll notice that the room benefits from having a king size double bed, a day table, a couple of leather armchairs, and about five standalone lamps. I found the bed to be a comfortable medium fur mattress. If you prefer softer mattresses, this might be a bit harsh for you. The bed linen though is pure white Egyptian cotton and immaculate. Padding now back towards the door to the hallway, you can see the storage space available to you in this half of the hotel room. Opposite the bed at the end of the room is a console mounting around a 40 inch LCD TV with quite a refreshing selection of UK and international cable TV stations, which is unusual in many hotels. The TV also features interactive hotel services. The bedside tables, as well as featuring a stand lamp, have controls for lighting throughout the entire hotel room, as well as a standard hotel telephone. Overall, I'd rate this hotel room as fairly basic, but it is immaculately clean, exceptionally well maintained, and it also smells great. Right, time to take a look at the bathroom, which as you know, can make or break a hotel room. A rule of thumb for hotels is that if you find the room is fairly compact, then so will the bathroom be. So no surprises in what we're gonna find in here, is there? What you get in this hotel, in a standard room, is a low flush European WC pan. On the right, a Belfast sink with a console and a large mirror. And on the left, a shower enclosure room. It is quite tight in here, and I found it difficult to film, let alone use uh, as a bathroom. So therefore, it's probably only enough space for one person to comfortably move around here. The bathroom is tiled throughout with beige stone ceramic tiling. The utilities are white porcelain with glass and chrome. Other than that, there aren't many bells and whistles in here at all. It is a fairly basic bathroom and all you get is a hairdryer and a shaver socket. That's it. On the plus side though, the shower, which is not a power shower per se, is still quite powerful and it was also very hot if you want it to be. These are two things that are found to be lacking in a lot of hotels. So yeah, top marks for the shower room here. As we exit the bathroom, directly opposite us is the storage and wardrobe space. So let's take a quick look at that. 
the wardrobe is automatically illuminated when you open one of the doors, which is handy. You're provided with dressing gowns as a couple and also an ironing board, which again is great. You'll also find on the left hand side of the wardrobe a standard low security hotel safe. Under the TV console, you'll find a glass fronted fridge. Not a mini bar, there is no stock, but it is handy if you want to chill wine or beer. And also, cheapo coffee making facilities. Now, I take a fairly dim view of five star hotels that don't feature Nespresso machines. Come on, get with it, you're supposed to be a five star hotel. So, a black mark to the St Pancras for this failing. No, the only place to get a decent coffee in this hotel is back on the ground floor at the lobby bar called the Handsome Bar, named after handsome cabs, taxis. Remember, this used to be a taxi rank in the 1930s and 40s. I do like the decor down here, but this could be a very busy and therefore a noisy part of the hotel. And there are other dining and drinking options available. So let's look at those. OK, I'll explain why I didn't go first of all. I didn't go to the Chambers Club, which is a private bar available only to guests staying in the suites in this hotel. Obviously not me then. And then a rooftop garden, which for some reason was closed. I never got to the bottom of why that was closed. It is somewhere decent to have a drink in the open air, uh, certainly in the summer months. And finally, the booking office, restaurant and bar. We'll take a look at that in a minute. Before we head to the booking office for a beer and a meal, I feel duty bound to show you the St Pancras Hotel spa facilities. As I was only staying one night, I didn't really have time to take advantage of these facilities. But this hotel does have an excellent spa in the basement. The pool is very decorative, but it is basically just a large plunge pool, not a full-size swimming pool that you might expect in a five-star hotel. Still, it's not bad for a legacy Victorian building. And to be honest, the style is quite historically accurate, although it is a modern build and resembles a Victorian bathhouse of the 1800s. There is also a small fitness centre which is available to guests 24 hours a day. With the tour of the spa complete, let's get back to what we intended to do, drinking and eating. So I had a reservation in the booking office restaurant, and you do need to make a reservation here. The restaurant is the station's old booking office, hence the clever name. It is a fine dining restaurant and is fairly pricey. There's also a bar if you just want to have a drink. The decor in the booking office is very similar to that of the handsome bar next door. After all, it is the same repurposed Victorian building updated for the 21st century. The restaurant, particularly at weekends, can get really, really busy, which is why you must reserve. And even then, it can be a bit chaotic inside as the space is at a complete premium and you'll find that the seating is quite close together. The restaurant is fairly dimly lit, which I don't really have a problem with because it accentuates the Victorian brickwork really well. And that actually kind of adds to the atmosphere, the Victorian atmosphere of the booking office. Do you know what? I completely forgot to photograph our food for your interest. Never mind, I can describe it. It wasn't particularly good. It wasn't particularly bad. Don't think it was worth the money we paid for it, but that's London for you, isn't it? The service though was very, very slow. It took 30 minutes to get our main course out, which really isn't acceptable. That was remedied though by a very attentive wine waiter who kept topping our drinks up. So yeah, that kind of balanced it out. Do I recommend this restaurant? Yeah, it's okay, but I think there's better restaurants available in the neighborhood. What the booking office does do though well is it has a very extensive wine cellar and a great choice of beers. And if you're just coming out for a drink, I think this is an ideal place to wind away the evening, particularly if you've got an early start the next day and you don't want to get very far from the hotel. Also remember that the Eurostar terminal is literally just 100 metres, three minutes walk away from here. So you could have lunch in the booking office and then jump straight on the Eurostar for Paris. Final thoughts. Do I recommend this hotel? Yes, but do remember, particularly if you're on a budget, that there are similar sized hotel rooms within a short distance of St Pancras, which are much, much cheaper. But for the restaurant and the spa facilities, in addition to the hotel room, I think it's worth it. Also, the convenience of being right next to the Eurostar terminal cannot be understated, particularly if you've got a really early start in the mornings. As ever, thanks for watching my video. 
If you found this video useful, please consider giving it a like. It helps with the algorithm. Also, if you enjoy hotel reviews and travel content, consider subscribing to my channel and check out my other reviews around the world. Thank you. Bye now.